I would just like to welcome you all this morning to worship. We're so glad to see so many people this morning to celebrate uh, the Celebrate Recovery Group. So I think I'd like to open with prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We come before you and bow our heads. We praise your name for your goodness, for your mercy, for your kindness and your patience with us. You are mighty, you are holy, you are worthy of all praise. We just thank you, Lord, for this time that we can share together. We thank you for this church that's opened its doors to celebrate recovery. We thank you for Pastor Ed and for Austin, for their talent, for their skills, for their patience with us, for their leadership, for their kindness. We thank you for all the people, Lord, that have helped, have volunteered, have brought food, have prayed for us, have encouraged us. And Lord, we just lift up those people that are here this morning and the ones that will be coming. Lord, may you bring all of us, and I do mean all of us, need your help. May we serve you in ways that are pleasing, with kindness and patience and mercy. Lord, bring people in our community that need your help so much. Give us wisdom to reach out to the ones that need your help and recognize that we need your help as well, Lord. I thank you for the fellowship, the love, the learning that has taken place here on Monday nights. We just ask you to continue blessing, that you bring more people to help volunteer, that you bring people that need your help. And Lord, we lift up this morning in your holy and mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Chris. We want to welcome each and every one of you here this morning. I encourage you, if you would, if you take out your program. Uh, and on the look on the right hand side, there's a tear off section there for everyone in the room. I encourage you to take a moment and uh, fill out your name and your address and your telephone number, your email. If you're a guest today, if you're a regular attendee, just give us your name. And uh, we'd ask everybody to put those back in the black box when they, there's two black boxes right here in the center, uh, behind the center doors. We encourage you to put them in there as a record of your visit. If you have any prayer requests, we love to pray. We're a praying church, and we just encourage you to flip it over and put some prayer requests on there if you would. Well, just a few announcements. As you can tell, this is Celebrate Recovery Sunday. We did this last year. This is our second time doing this. We try to do this in October, and it's just going to be a great time, going to be a different service, and uh, we're just going to say there may be some changes in here and there as we go through, but it's going to be great. So we encourage you to sit back and just be encouraged by the testimonies and see what God is doing in this ministry that meets in our building on Monday nights. And some of you are involved with it in, in various ways. I just want to remind you that there's no connect groups today, nor Sunday school. Uh, next week, we'll dive back into the book of Galatians, and we'll have our connect groups and Sunday school at uh, 1045 beginning next week. But today we have our semi-annual meeting. Uh, please join us after the worship service, whether you're a member or just uh, uh, someone who's attending. It's open to anyone who would like to come. And uh, it's our semi-annual church business meeting. Child care is provided downstairs. And we're just going to give you a six-month update of our financial report, uh, remodel update, what's going on with that, and just open up for some any questions that the uh, church family may have for the elders. We always like to do that at the end to get some input from them. So there's nothing to vote on. We encourage you to stay. We don't expect it to be a very long meeting, but that starts at 1045. Now, coming up, it's hard to believe we flip our calendar on Wednesday to November 1st, right? And so coming up on November 19th is our Thanksgiving feast at 5 o'clock downstairs. Next week, we'll be putting the sheets out for you to sign up for what food items you will bring. And some will make, bring, make turkey and all kinds of things. So it's one of our best services of the year where we share testimonies, share music, and share a meal together. So I encourage you to just get the word out. I'll be thinking about it. So next week and the week after, you can sign up for that. 
Well, also, Operation Christmas Child, you see the display out there in the lobby, and uh, we really need to get more people involved with that. We encourage you to grab some boxes. Um, yes, Sandy's back here. She's in charge. She's shaking her head. Yes, we, wanted to, we were hoping for 100 boxes this year, so we encourage you. We got time to get it done. I know I picked up my boxes this week. We're working on that already, so pick up boxes, take them. It's Dollar Tree, Walmart, wherever, and uh, fill them out. And there's information on what to put in the box, what not to put in the box. And also a tag. You need to pick up a tag to, for a boy and girl that has the ages on there. $10 goes inside for the shipping. So please, please make sure you uh, do that. It's one of our ways that we give Christmas away here at church. Don't forget, next Saturday night into Sunday morning, turn your clocks back one hour so you'll be on time for worship next Sunday. Okay, it's that time to move back away from daylight savings into standard time. And then in your program, which looks like a book today, you've got a lot of inserts. If you open it up, you're going to see one has a blank calendar like this. And we want to give that out today. And what we've been doing the last number of years is encouraging you to take this and at least put one, two, or three things that you're grateful for as you go through the month of November. It's amazing how this will help you uh, emotionally and mentally if you just sit down and take a moment and write down something that God did that day that you can be grateful for. On the back, we've included something new this year, 21 Great Ideas to Practice Thankfulness. There's some ideas here of ways that you could uh, expand this idea. Thank a teacher. Desserts for trash collectors, all kinds of things there you could look at to prompt you to maybe show appreciation to other people in your life as well. So keep that in mind. Now I'm looking for Barb Hansen Schwartz. Are we ready for testimonies? Okay, you can come. And then I'm going to come after the testimonies to pray for the offering. And right now, we're going to allow the kids to be dismissed. The kids can go downstairs. We're going to let them go down early today, third grade on down. You're welcome to go downstairs. At this time, Barb's going to come and uh, take over the program here. Good morning. And thank you for letting us share this morning with you. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with life issues, and my name is Barb. Celebrate Recovery is a Christian-based program first launched over 30 years ago. There today exceeds 35,000 locations in all 50 states, 25 countries, and over 7 million recoveries. It surpasses a typical AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, program in that it assists anyone who has a hurt, habit, or hang-up to be an overcomer. It's a program that's desperately needed in our community, especially following the last couple of years. Right now, opioids are a great concern. Scott County ranks number one for opioids in the state of Iowa. Celebrate Recovery is an ongoing program walking participants through worship, 12 steps, and small groups. Our elementary age program called Children's Place, which we are preparing our kids for now. We also have a program called The Landing for Teenagers. It is the same material that the adults use, only it's on a teenage level. And right now that is on hold because we don't have a leader. We also want to start a program for the vets called Welcome Home, and it, of course, will be led by a vet. We even have available, if we ever uh, can do it, it's a motorcycle group, and it's called Broken Chains. And there is one in Iowa right now, or in the area. We were able to qualify for the national roster of Celebrate Recovery since December of 21. We met all their requirements. Now this allows us to be on the national map so anyone traveling through the state of Iowa near Bettendorf 
can come Monday night to one of our Celebrate Recoveries. We also um, have been working with the Moline Correctional Service, and now they're meeting on the second, fourth, and fifth Sunday of each month. We were also um, have the privilege of right now working with the Thompson Penitentiary. Um, they want to start a celebrate group within their walls. I received a letter from one of the inmates. So we're working with their chaplain at this time. Now, Blake and Jeanette would like to share a conversation for someone who wants to know more about CR. Good morning. I'm a thankful believer in Jesus Christ. I have struggled with weight control and codependency. My name is Johnette. Hi, Johnette. Good morning. I'm a faithful believer in Jesus Christ. My name is Blake. I'm a recovering alcoholic. So, Blake, I just have some questions today about Celebrate Recovery. So, the first one is, how do I know if Celebrate Recovery is for me? Well, I am so glad you asked, Johnette. Celebrate Recovery offers a person the opportunity to participate in a group fellowship where love and hope combine with God's purpose to mend our lives. Ask yourself, are there things in my life that I do that hurt others? Is there something I wish I could live without? Is it time to crack my denial and admit that I am not in control of my life? Do I have a painful habit or hang-up from which I need to be free? If you answered yes to any of these statements, then we encourage you to attend a CR Open to see if it is for you. Well, I'm sure I might, but how do I know if Celebrate Recovery might be beneficial for me? Well, anyone who struggles with the kinds of hurts, habits, and hang-ups can benefit from CR. Do you struggle with a particular issue that seems to have such strength and power over you that it has prevented you from experiencing any real victory? Have you been secretly hoping for a place for a safe place to share your struggles and get healing. And CR is for you. Hurts, habits, and hang-ups? What does that mean? Well, you may be thinking that recovery is only for those with alcohol or drug problems. This could not be further from the truth. A hurt, habit, or hang-up is anything that hinders your walk with God. Well, what does a typical Celebrate Recovery evening look like if I came? Well, how, how often does CR meet? We meet every week, except for snow closings and holidays if they are on a Monday. We meet here at Pleasant View Baptist Church, which is 6400 Crow Creek Road, Bettendorf, Iowa. Meals are served from 515 to 550. Worship starts at 6. Open group share begins at 710. And we usually finish by 815. If you're ready to get real, CR is a safe place to heal. God bless you, and we hope to see you soon. So I would be put into a small group. How would I know that it would be safe for me to share my story there with people I don't know? Well, CR insists that certain guidelines apply during open share groups and step study groups. The guidelines are distinctive features of the ministry designed to create a safe environment for participants to share. So do I have to be a member of this church to attend? Uh, no, you're not required to attend or be a member of the church. CR is a ministry for anyone who is interested in a Christ-centered recovery program. So if I go to this group, do I have to share? Do I have to talk out loud to people? Uh, you'll never be required to share in the open share groups. You can take as long as you need to feel safe enough to share. In the step studies, however, everyone is required to share as the group moves through the questions in the curriculum books. Who leads the groups? Uh, CR groups are not led by pastors, teachers, or counselors. Instead, CR groups are facilitated by compassionate volunteers who have, by the grace of God, walked through a process of recovery from their own hurts, habits, and hang-ups. So, how does Celebrate Recovery differ, then, from Alcoholics Anonymous? Uh, CR incorporates the 12 steps with a distinctly Christian approach. We also address many more issues than just alcoholism. For a detailed list of issues, check the Hurts, Habits, and Hang-Ups section on our website. So 
But what if I don't have an addiction? Why would I come? <laughs> so if you don't have an addiction but have been deeply affected by another person's addictions, can CR help me? Yes, CR also ministers to people who are affected by others who are battling addiction or some other destructive behavior. You're welcome to join us and gain support and wisdom. Uh, there is in the bulletin, the flyer in the bulletin that explains how a hurt becomes a habit and then a hang-up that might keep you from reaching your full potential. What if I can't come to a meeting some night, I'm not able to come? What happens then? Well, you're welcome to come whenever you can to the large group meeting and open share groups. However, if you join a step study, you, you will be expected to come each week until the curriculum is completed. Thanks, Blake. That helps me understand a little bit more what Celebrate Recovery is all about. My pleasure, Jonna. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Greg, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, my one and only higher power. And I struggle with uh, alcohol and drug addiction, depression, and other life issues. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity this morning to share one of my testimonies with you. I've titled this testimony, Unconditional Love. I'll see if I can get through it. It's hard to imagine that I, as a father, could love myself more than my own child. Sadly, it was a reality that I must face every day. You'd think it's, you'd think it's, you'd, think ne you'd never think it's humanly possible for a father to love himself. More unconditionally than he loves his child, my beautiful daughter. But I relied on substances to numb the hurt and the pain I felt inside and fell into a, a deep state of depression. Naturally, we are raised to believe parents are the most perfect human beings. And if something is not okay, parents would be the last ones to break down. I wasn't that parent. Parents are supposed to love their child unconditionally and are, and are inherently supposed to prioritize, prioritize them over anything else in the world even themselves. I wasn't that parent. Fathers should be their, children, their children's hero and role model that they look up to and admire. I wasn't that hero. A strong, loving father relationship is truly irreplaceable and has a long-lasting impact. And can it, it can influence thoughts feelings, and identity regarding future relationships for your children. How a fa father interacts with his daughter can affect self-esteem and physical, mental, and spiritual health. I'm a husband and a father today, or I am a husband, a father, and today, a recovering addict. As I mentioned earlier, I was, an ad I was an addict filled with a lot of hate, anger towards everyone, even myself. I was a slave to the numbing effects of drug and alcohol to hide from the world, escape from reality, and suppress old feelings. I fell into a deep state of depression and became suicidal. I was ready to go home. Because of my addiction and mental health, it negatively affected my, my wife and my daughter. To this, day, to this day, I am still not aware of all the negative things I said to them, all the horrible things they did while I was stoned and drunk. The one thing I do know, the ne negative behavior had a great impact on them and affected them both in many ways. My attitude was very disapproving and negative. I was emotionally distant, 
verbally abusive, neglected, and pretty much absent from their life. These things all have had a negative effect on my daughter, who only wanted her father's love and approval. Realizing that someday, somebody who is supposed to love you does not love you in the way they are supposed to is difficult to face. But sometimes in life, we have to accept things for what they are and try to make amends to the right thing, to the to the to right the wrong. A little over seven months ago on a Monday evening, I walked through the doors here at Pleasant Valley Baptist Church, scared, ashamed, hurting, and ready to give up hope. I had hit bottom. On a Sunday morning in March, I was showering with the thought of ending it all. Then I heard a voice say, go to church. Not a soft, pleasant voice, but a fatherly sounding voice that could not be ignored. I went to two, two church services that day, different churches. Sorry, Pastor, it wasn't here, it was somewhere else. <laughs> I came to my first Celebrate Recovery meeting following that encounter in March, and God keeps me bringing me back every week. I was sitting out there one, one Monday, one, sitting out there where you guys are, where you all, all are, one Monday evening. And during the meeting, I accepted Jesus Christ as my higher power and my Lord and Savior once again. I had been saved once before. I give all the praise and glory to Jesus Christ for saving me and leading me to CR. He has been working very hard in my life. And I give all my love and gratitude to my wife, my daughter, and my friends at CR for their love and support. But let's think about it a second. I'm married to a wonderful woman. She is one of God's children. I, I didn't write all this. This was what I've heard in different things. Therefore, God, my father, is also my God father-in-law. Take it a step further. God has gifted me with a beautiful daughter, his daughter, to raise. She, too, is God's heir. Therefore, my daughter is my king's princess. It's mind-blowing to me. Every father king wants his daughter princess treated with dignity and honor. I stand before you today as a new man and hopefully as a better father and husband. I know reversing the devastating effect of a father-daughter addict relationship will take time. I can honestly say my relationship with my daughter has improved. How do I know this? by actions. Someone saying, I love you, doesn't necessarily mean they do. Look for love not in words, but in actions. If somebody loves you, they are gonna show it by their actions. Her love for me is not just a word any longer. It's a heartfelt emotion and will continue to grow as long as I remain sober and stay connected to God. A few days after I started this journey, my daughter sent me two inspirational songs to help me get through the rough times. I Thank You God by Maverick City Music and Resurrection Day by Wren Collective. I'll never forget those songs because they all have a, per a special meaning to me. My newly restored faith in God has had an amazing impact on my daughter. She has been a believer her entire life and a child of God. On August 13th, she was baptized and made new. There's not enough time to tell you all the changes that have occurred since becoming sober and how wonderful Wonderfully amazing my daughter is, but I am honored and proud to be her father 
and gracious to be called her dad. Unconditional love. There's only one person who gives us unconditional love. Ephesians 2, 8 and NIV. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift for God. All we have to do is believe. Thank you for that great testimony. We have another one coming up here soon. But I want to pause here to take a moment, focus on our offering. Those of you who are regular attendees of our church, we just want to encourage you and remind you to give generously, give to our general fund, and uh, as we think about benevolent to the deacon fund as well. I'm encouraged by 2 Corinthians 8, 7. It says, but as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and all earnestness and our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. One of the ways that we're stretched in our Christian life by faith is by giving financially. So as we pray today, we just encourage you to continue to give. Thank you for those that have been faithfully giving. If you want to give today, the offering boxes are out there outside the middle doors. But let's pray and let's dedicate this morning's offering to the Lord. Father, we know that every good and perfect gift comes down from you, Lord. We know that you've blessed us with uh, talents and abilities. Many of us are able to work and uh, do things that we enjoy passionately for our vocation, and it's all because of you. And Lord, part of, uh, part of giving of ourselves to you is giving of our finances as well. And so, Lord, we just ask today that you will bless these offerings, continue to uh, help them to come in so that we can continue to do kingdom work like we're talking about today with Celebrate Recovery, with the 40-some kids we have in Awana with youth group and the ladies' event we had yesterday and so many things, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunities. But we know that uh, in our world that we live in, it's through finances and money that we need to carry out your work, and that's the, the conduit. So, Lord, help us. Help us to excel in our giving. Help us to be stretched in our faith and take this day's offering and use it to further your kingdom. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you at this time to stand with us as we worship the Lord through music this morning. When I was buried beneath my chin Oh, 
Good morning. I'm a grateful believer, in Jesus Christ. And um, before I started coming to CR, I was abusing alcohol. My name is Dan, and uh, I'm really humbled to be here. Um, so Jesus is our higher power, and we believe in living out the Christ-centered twelve steps. Our change comes from trusting in Jesus, doing the work of the 12 steps, by applying biblical principles of conviction, conversion, surrender, confession, restitution, prayer, quiet time, witnessing, sharing your struggles with others, and praying for one another. Oh, a life-changing transformation comes from completing a 12-step program. It really does. Um, I'm going to read through the 12 steps. Is it on the screen? Yay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives have become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good Cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. Step two. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2, 13. Step three. We made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, from Romans 12, 1. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord, Lamentations 3:40. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other 
that you may be healed, James 5, 16. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up, James 4, 10. We humbly asked him to remove all of our shortcomings, step seven, by the way. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Step eight. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. Step nine. We made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Step 10. We continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Step 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16 Step 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, try to carry this message to others. Practice these principles in all of our affairs. Brothers, someone is caught in a sin. You who are spiritual should restore them gently. But watch yourself, for you may be be tempted. Galatians 6, 1. Uh, thank you. That's it. Oh, that's it. <laughs> I'm James. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. This is my testimony and my journey with recovery. I struggle with life issues, mainly depression, anxiety, porn, and alcohol. I'm the youngest of four siblings, and growing up I felt unwanted as my brother, who was hyperactive, received much of my parents' attention. I was pretty shy and did not have many friends. I was the black sheep of the family. My mother said that she had a nervous breakdown when she was carrying me as a baby. I was the youngest, and she went through counseling, and I don't remember being picked up a whole lot and, and saying, I love you. Uh, by the time I was 14, my world began to unravel. Um, I went to the Presbyterian Church. I grew up um, with somewhat a normal middle-class family. Um, my parents had gotten divorced as I fell into depression. One year later, my mom and dad remarried, so I had a stepdad and a stepmom. I did not know where I fit in. I was physically abused, and my dad told me that if I was around my mom, that I would be an emotional cripple. My dad did not say, I love you, son. I am proud of you. Instead, all I heard was, you are weak. You hear this often enough, you believe it. I ended up in the mental ward of the hospital. I was on too many meds to count. I had a number of side effects. I was labeled schizophrenic. Doctors had told me that I would not be able to lead a normal life. I went to stay with my brother. And during that time, my brother had baptized me in the Mormon church. I experienced much demonic activity while being in the church. <laughs> Uh, I can remember demons pulling me off the bed. I had to sleep with the light on. I could not, I couldn't even pray. My tongue, my tongue was bound. I was in bondage. 
in the Mormon church. They had told me that if I were to ever leave the church, I would be damned for rejecting the gospel. It took two years for me to leave the Mormon church. And by the grace of Jesus Christ and Almighty God, he protected me. And I asked him for his protection, and he shielded me. I had left the church, finally. I had to drop out of high school in the 10th grade due to being hospitalized. I was now 17. I was struggling to fit in. I became almost unrecognizable from the meds I was on. I gained a lot of weight. I was bloated, and people that I went to school with did not recognize me. I felt shame and rejection. During treatments, my doctor suggested I go into the Navy and keep my mental illness a secret. Well, my stepdad had taken me down to get um, my GED, and I took GED classes at Scott Community College, and I went into the Navy. I had an affair with a 32-year-old woman. I was 19, and that, I believe, opened the door to my porn addiction. While aboard ship, a shipmate gave me dirty magazines to look at. With the tragedies of my parents getting divorced when I was 14, my grandparents dying, my brother getting killed in a motorcycle accident at 19, I had a nervous breakdown. I was hospitalized and put into a mental institution, Pine Knoll. <laughs> After being honorably discharged from the Navy, I went to Scott Community College and took psychology and went to AIC. Well, I proved the doctors wrong, and I proved them that told me that I would never leave a normal life. I started attending Bettendorf Christian Church. Carl Roberts, the pastor, baptized me, and I was involved in the young adults at the church. At age 25, I moved out to San Diego for what I thought was a fresh start for me. I worked sales and marketing jobs, and I fell in with the wrong crowd of people. I tried meth. I almost died from cardiac arrest. It scared me enough that I never tried it again. I became homeless while out in San Diego. Desperate, I came across a homeless mission. I found out that it housed gay people, both lesbian and gay men. They left me alone. I went door to door in San Diego communities to bring in funds to support the gay mission. That is how I earned my keep. That was 35 years ago. I am not that person today. By the grace of Jesus Christ, my Savior. The thing about Jesus is he meets you where you are. I didn't have to be perfect. I didn't have to perform. He met me in my dark pit just where I was, and I praise Almighty God for that. They say you are sick as your secrets. I struggled with porn for 30 years. Carrying the shame, I convinced myself that I probably would never have a normal relationship so I could fantasize in my own mind and not be rejected by someone. I left the mission and I got involved in stealing and scamming businesses to survive. I was not walking with God. I was running and hiding from God and myself. Well, finally, I moved back to Iowa and I had met a woman and we lived together for nine years. When that ended, I fell into a deep depression and started drinking heavy. All I could think is, is I wanted the pain to stop. After a series of failed marriages and broken relationships, I tried to take my life. I was in my apartment one night, I drank a bottle of Pine Sol, and I took 100 Prozacs. I ended up in the emergency room and hooked up to an IV. By the grace of God, I am still here. I shut everybody out. Later, after my best friend Yogi, my dog, got killed by a pit bull, I was devastated. And though my parents had passed away just over three years ago, I was mad at God. I just thought he was punishing me, so I shut him out and went further into isolation. It was then, when I was at the end of my rope with no power over my addictions, that I called on the name of the Lord. Help me if you are there. Show me you are real. I prayed God would bring me into a church. 
and three years ago I found Pleasant View. For once in my life I felt at peace. They accepted me, I joined. They were also having Celebrate Recovery at this church and I joined that. CR holds me accountable. They accepted me where I was and did not judge me and I found friends. Second Corinthians says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If it weren't for this church, and the support of CR, I would be lost. Now I look forward to being an active member of this church in CR. I read devotions, and I would like to do a 12-step study and become a leader. Thanks for letting me share. How's that? Can you hear me now? All right. Hear me now and listen later, right? Isn't that what they say? All right. I'm a believer and follower of Jesus. I used to struggle with alcohol, cocaine, and smoking doobies. And I still struggle with bob My name is still Bob. Welcome this morning. As we are sharing about Celebrate Recovery, I want to touch on a couple things uh, this morning. And I should... Wrap it up, two or three hours. I don't, nobody's in a hurry, I don't think. But anyway, so one thing we do at Celebrate Recovery is we uh, recognize periods of sobriety or milestones through uh, uh, people's journey through recovery, and we do that with chips or tokens. And we uh, recognize, this is just a sample here, a blue one, and I'm going to go through a couple of reasons why we give out blue ones, but we have... Uh, the journey begins as the blue chip, and then if you have 30 days, 60 days, all the way up to, I have 27 years of sobriety now without drinking or drugs, so, but only by the grace of God. And so we, we recognize those milestones as a reminder of where we came from and where we can go. And so this morning, I'm going to go through our, our presentation on the journey begins just to give you an example of what we do with the blue chip. Now, the first thing we'd give out a blue chip for is if it was your first time at Celebrate Recovery. So we would ask everybody, is it your first time? And we would acknowledge that by giving them a blue chip and encourage them to keep coming back. And so the second reason we would give out a blue chip as people go through life, as people go through recovery, we, we work on some issues and let God purge out some junk out of our life. Maybe it's alcohol, drugs, and then maybe other things that... God wants to work on anger or uh, codependence or whatever it may be. And as we work on those things, we realize there's still some more junk to work on. You know? And so we're, we call it a sanctification process, right? We, we purify our life. We let God purge junk out. And so as we realize that there's something else we need to work on, we turn over a new struggle to Jesus. We memorialize that with the journey begins, Chip. And so you can start on the next struggle. And then the third reason... We give out a blue chip as if you make a new commitment to Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, in the, in the back on our table, there's a couple of these tracks. Who is your higher power? And, you know, we, uh, in, in the Christian world, we make Jesus Christ our higher power. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says our higher power, and this is the Phillips uh, edition, translation. It says our higher power tells us my grace is enough for you. For where, where there is weakness, my power is shown the more completely. And so higher power in the Phillips version is a biblical term. So, but we celebrate higher power as Jesus Christ alone. Now some organizations, groups, programs may, may say you can make your higher power a, a different thing. Maybe a butterfly or, or a motorcycle. Or I've worked with people who their higher power was their dead grandma or, you know, but... And fake made-up higher power has no higher power at all, okay? In, in this little booklet, it talks about Webster's Dictionary calls a higher power a spirit or being such as God that has great power, 
strength, knowledge, etc., and it can affect nature and the lives of people. Belief in a higher power. That's Webster. So a higher power has to have power, right? A butterfly doesn't have much higher power over us or a motorcycle or inanimate object. So it has to be God. And the AA term for the higher power used throughout the big book of AA is a reference to a power greater than we are. And that's Jesus Christ. He is the only true power greater than us. And so we have to put our faith and trust in him. And so um, as you, if you want to grab one of these, they're free. Just take one to look at it. It talks about a higher power, how to make Jesus your higher power. And uh, it has the steps along with it and then scripture to go along with it. We admit, we believe, we confess. And then we look at those steps and we look at um, how to make Jesus our higher power. And so I don't share all of that through Celebrate Recovery, but I do share about the fact that Jesus loves you. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die on a cross so that you could have forgiveness of sin if you accept him as your savior, right? We ask Jesus to come into our heart. We repent of our sins. We turn away from our old life and we turn to him. It doesn't make us perfect. Well, it does in God's eyes, but not in our human eyes. And so then we grow toward him, right? We make a commitment to follow God. That doesn't mean we understand it all. That doesn't, it just means we're going to try to follow him. And so we make him our higher power, our Lord, our Savior. We give him our all in all, and we turn it over to him. And so every time we have a Celebrate Recovery, we have, offer an opportunity for people to accept Jesus as their higher power. Our scripture, John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. So Jesus is the only way to the Father. There is no other higher power that's going to get you to God. There is no other path that works. There is no other journey except through Jesus Christ and him alone. And so <clears throat> I'm going to offer you all the same opportunity I do every night, every Monday night at Celebrate Recovery, to pray that prayer, to ask Jesus to be your higher power, to commit your life to him, and, and start a new relationship and, and begin a new journey with God in charge of your life. And if you've done that, maybe a long time ago, you've been saved, converted, born again, but you're not walking where you think you should be with God, you can say the same prayer and renew that or rededicate that relationship to God today to start a new relationship with him. And if you prayed that prayer and everything's right with the world, I'm just going to ask that you say that prayer just to encourage those around you. So I'm going to ask you all to pray with me today. Just repeat after me, dear God, I come before you this morning and realize I need your help. I want to make you my Lord. And Jesus, come into my heart. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I repent and turn to you. I want to make you my higher power, my Lord and Savior. I give you my life and my heart. I give you my addictions and my hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And I receive from you a new life beginning today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer and meant it today and Jesus is your higher power, I'd recognize that with a chip. If anybody wants to get a chip, I've got a whole stack of them here. <laughs> anybody pray that prayer and mean it and accept Jesus as their higher power today? Okay. And so we give everybody that opportunity and sometimes people make that commitment, sometimes they don't, but we make it available to all of them. And so in your flyer, you've got a handout on denial. And so I'm just going to go over that a little bit. If you have one, that's okay. If you don't, I'm just going to share a few things and hit, hit the high points on denial and how we look at that through Celebrate Recovery. So I'm going to start with, in, in my book, 12 Steps in the Bible, which is a free book on how the 12 steps relate to the Bible. And I wrote this about 20 years ago before I ever heard of Celebrate Recovery. And and God led me through each one of these steps, and I realized that, you know, that's what God brought me through, even though I didn't know what I was doing, you know. I didn't know about the steps, but each one of those. But I just want to read a scripture out of there, and this is out of the Message Bible, Psalms 88, 1 through 9. And it says, God, 
you're my last chance of the day. I spent, my night on, I spent the night on my knees before you. Put me on your salvation agenda. Take notes on the trouble I'm in. I've had my fill of trouble. I'm camped on the edge of hell. I'm written off as a lost cause. One more statistic, a hopeless case, abandoned as already dead. I'm caught in a maze and I can't find my way out, blinded by tears of pain and frustration. Anybody ever felt that way? We all probably have. Some of you are right there in the middle of that right now. And, and he gives us a but, though. There's a but. We can understand that, yes, we've all been there. Yes, we, some of those things apply to us right now. But God, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, but, but he said to me, my grace, my favor and loving kindness and mercy is enough for you, sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am truly strong, able, powerful, and divine strength. So no matter where you're at in your walk today, whether it's spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, whatever may be going on, God has an answer, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's our hope. But one thing we have to do to make that happen is we have to come out of our denial. So many times we live in a, in a denial, and it helps us get through the day sometimes. Sometimes we don't want to look at our problems. We just don't want to deal with them. We push them aside. Sometimes we, we do that for so long that we've shoved them down so far and so long that we just pretend they don't even exist. Well, Celebrate Recovery is a place where we can dig down and find those feelings and emotions, experience them, and get better. That's the whole purpose of it, so that we realize what's making us uh, use what's making us messed up, what's making us go to drugs, can be fixed through Jesus Christ. So part of denial, it's the very first lesson in Celebrate Recovery. It's the very first step, the very first uh, part of, of the recovery process is the denial lesson. And it starts by saying, based on principle one, realize I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and my life is unmanageable. Ever feel like that? <laughs> we, we don't have the power to do the right thing. We want to, but we can't. Even Paul says that. I have a desire to do what is right, but I don't have the ability to do it. And we know that our life is unmanageable. That's anything that we don't have control over. You know, whether it's an addiction or whether it's a, a family issues or whether it's finances, things that we can't manage, and then we can come to the point where we need to begin to recover. And celebrate recovery is a place for recovery, and some people come to celebrate recovery because they're alcoholics, because they're drug addicts, because they, they, they just realize their life's a mess and they need help. Other people come to celebrate recovery because they love people and they're believers and they want to help encourage other people. So they come and be a part of it so that they can be, help be, uh, make others accountable, help be a mentor, be a, a guide for them, help and encourage them and love them. And, and then oftentimes they find out, well, they, they need to celebrate recovery too, but you know, so I encourage you all as part of this church has, has made uh, the ministry available to celebrate recovery on Monday night because of your financial commitment, because of your time commitment, uh, all of the, the planning and organizing through the remodel and all the stuff that uh, that commitment is well worth it to, to this church and to, to the world. There's people that come through this celebrate recovery right here that have been born again and changed their lives. You heard that from the pulpit today because of your commitment to allow Celebrate Recovery to be here. Whether you're just to say yes on the ballot or whether you come in and clean or cook or, or make all the commitments that need to make this happen, your role is contributing to that. So I just want to encourage you that it's very vital to this community and a, and a very important outreach and we all appreciate that commitment to be able to help others. All right, Matthew 5, 3, it says... Um, Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. And then it's based on step one of the 12 steps. And these 12 steps are taken from AA. They're changed a little bit, but not very much. The 12 steps of AA talk about God five times in there. It's not a secular program. It's a godly program. But some will change it to make it what they want it to be for their group or for themselves. But AA was designed as a, a program to find help and through God. The, the founder was a born-again Christian eventually, not at first. Now, he was, he was an atheist and agnostic, but then he became a Christian and wanted to take that 
ability to help others. And so it's watered down a little bit in some places, but it's still a spiritual program that can help people. So we took the 12 steps, altered them a little bit, and made it a, a, a spiritual program. And Jesus Christ is the higher power, and, and that's it. There's no other higher power except Jesus in, the, in our program. So step one, it says we, would, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, and our life had become unmanageable. Somebody says, well, how do I know if it's a compulsive behavior or an addiction or, or if it's really influencing my life? I can, I've got it. I can control it. Well, myself, I say if you can quit for 30 days without any problem or complications, then maybe you're okay with it. But if you can't quit for 30 days without having physical DTs or, or mental withdrawals or, or problems giving it up, then you might have an issue. Romans 7, 18, it says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And so, you know, this says nothing good lives in us. So that ends the debate on whether we're born good or we're born evil. <laughs> you know, we're definitely born evil. You don't have to tell a kid how to do wrong, do you? Little kid, chocolate all over their face. Have you been in the cake? Nope. Mm -mm. You know, they steal and see, see something they want, they take it, right? That's not yours. I don't care. I want it, they, you know. They, they lie, they cheat. They we have to teach kids to be good, you know, and that's our role as parents and as a society is to teach them to do good because there's nothing good within us. So, so the uh, acrostic, every lesson in Celebrate Recovery has an acrostic. That means denial, the D-E-N-I-A-L. They all stand for something. And so we're going to go through that briefly this morning. And the D stands for... Uh, Denial disables our feelings. And there's scriptures on each one of these that go along. I'm not, for time's sake, I'm not going to share each one of them, but you can look through those. You've all got the insert there. So uh, denial disables our feelings. By representing our feelings or repressing our feelings, we freeze our emotions. And so we, we just shove them down, right? When we're in denial, we're not... Uh, feeling it. We're just shoving it down. We want to hide it. We want to put it away. We don't want people to know it. And we don't want to have to experience ourselves. And then the E, energy lost. We are as sick as our secrets. We cannot grow in recovery or our walk with Jesus Christ until we're ready to step out of our denial and follow the truth. And the truth is God's word. That's the truth. Jesus' way. Okay, then it negates our growth. So it, uh, oh, energy lost. I'm, I'm missed. Yeah, energy lost is the second one. A side effect of our denial is anxiety. When we're living in denial, we have a lot of anxiety and, and oftentimes a lot of lies and fears. We don't want people to find out, so that causes anxiety in our life. We don't want to have to deal with it, so we keep pushing it down. And then the end is negates our growth. And the eye, it isolates us from God. When we're walking in denial, um, 1 John 1, 5 through 7 says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all sin. And so we need to face the truth and come out of denial, because it isolates us from God. And... and, and Whatever it is our denial is, if it's sin, if it's hate, if it's anger, if it's unforgiveness, whatever it is, it is that we're trying to deny and not face keeps us from God, right? If it's sin, if it's unforgiveness of someone, if it's a lack of love, and all those things interfere with our relationship with God. So we need to come out of denial and accept those things so that we can get better, right? We want to improve our relationship with God. We want to improve our life. And then... Um, the A alienates us from our relationships. Denial tells us that we're getting away with it, and we think that nobody knows, but they do. When we're living in denial and we got our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, we're trying to hide away from everybody they know. They just don't want to face it either, right? They, they're uh, codependent, or they, they want to uh, take the easy route out. But we need to face it because it alienates us. And one example, personal example, how this alienates us is I, I had, are we recorded live or going out? Okay, well, we'll, we'll skip that story. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so uh, alienates our relationships. But when, so when you're in denial and you're, 
you're trying to have a relationship with somebody that maybe you, you have hate for them, but you're trying to deny it and you're trying to push it down, you know, that interferes with your relationship with them. So we need to get those uh, situations broken down and that causes fear, that causes us to isolate and all of those things. So we need to come out of denial. And then the L, it lengthens our pain. It extends the hurt. And it's truth like a surgery hurts for a little bit, but then it brings a cure, right? So we don't want to go through surgery, the pain of that, you know, cutting and digging and doing all that stuff. But sometimes we go through the surgery because on the other side there's healing, right? There's recovery, there's, there's victory. And so it is with denial. When we have hurts, habits, and hang-ups that we don't want to face, when we start digging that stuff out, it's going to hurt for a little bit. But the whole purpose is to get better. It's to get over that junk, to purge all that stuff out, to increase our relationship with God. So Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. People come to celebrate recovery to get help, but also to give help. And I'm briefly going to step, the 12 step that uh, was referred to is a 12 step study. It's a long, usually six months to a year commitment to meet once a week, to go through all of the lessons and do all of the steps, dig in, in deep and dig out all that junk. That's where the healing really, really begins. And uh, Celebrate Recovery here has two going right now, men's group and a women's group. They, they start one group all together and continue on. It's a commitment for the whole program, which usually close to a year-long program, They're meeting every week, working through the problems, being accountable and accountabilities. And so we'll be starting a new one of those probably in six months or a year or so. But that's where the, the healing really begins. So if you get an opportunity to get into one of the 12 steps and have the opportunity to make that commitment, that's where the healing really begins. And so God... Uh, one thing I, I tell the guys out to celebrate out at uh, Salvation Army, I do a celebrate recovery there on Sunday to the guys in the treatment center. And so it, it's a little different environment there, but, you know, I, I keep telling them that God can and he wants to help them. He can help them. First, you have to believe that, that God can do it, that God has power, right? He created the heavens and the earth, and, and he has the power to help change any situation in this world. He can do it. And... He wants to do it for you. I mean, God loves you enough that he wants to help you get better. He wants to help you recover. If you'd have been the only one created and born, Jesus still would have paid the price for you. He still would, wants to help you. He created each and every one of you. He made you. The Bible says before you were even formed in the womb, he knew you. And he made you. And he loves you. And no matter how far you may have strayed from his original purpose for your life, he still loves you and will, re will receive you back, forgive you completely, and accept you. And that's what he wants to do. The only thing that can keep us from that is us, right? We, we put a block in there. We say, maybe later, or, or maybe another day, or, or maybe not. Maybe I don't believe. So he can help you, and the most important thing is he wants to help you. He wants to help you. He wants to help you get better in your relationships. He wants to help you get over your addictions. He wants to help you have a good life, a happy life. He wants it all for you, and he wants you to have an eternal life. He made you the way he did to spend eternity in heaven with him. He wants to be in your presence. He wants you to come into his presence. He loves you. He's your heavenly father. He wants to be with you and spend time with you, and, and he made you. And why he made some of you the way he did, I'll never know. I don't know, but... That, that's his thing, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but, but he made you and he does love you and cares about you. And so through Celebrate, Celebrate Recovery, I found out that I'm a runner, right? Not a physical runner, that, that's not my thing, but I'm a runner. I, I run from God, I run from my feelings, I run from my problems, you know. I run, I run, I run. I was telling my wife that and she said, uh, she said, honey, if, you, if I'd known you were the prize at the end of the race, I would have ran backwards. So, <laughs> but anyway, she really did say that. But <laughs> I think she meant it as a joke. But anyway, so, <laughs> so give CR a try. At, um, um, oh, but the most important thing is give Jesus a try. Turn it over to him. And like James said in his testimony, God, if you're real, you know, that... that that's a prayer God hears, and that's a prayer God answers. God, if you're real, help me through this. 
God, if you're real, I'm tired of being in this jail cell. Help me to get out. God, if you're real, give me deliverance over my alcohol, my addictions, my problems. He will. And he'll show you how real he is and how much he loves you and how much he cares about you. And so that's, uh, that's what I got. I'm not, okay, let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we, we come before you again today. We're just so thankful for your, your love for us. We're thankful that you care for us, that you care enough, God, to, to help lift us out of our pit, whether it's depression or drugs or alcohol or unforgiveness or whatever it may be. You lift us up and, and plant us on a solid rock, and we're so thankful for that. I pray for each person here today that uh, got to hear the, the word of God and the plan of salvation, Lord, that you would help that to grow within their hearts. Lord, if they're believers, just help them to find the next level, the next step, and to get that much closer to you, God, because there's always a chance to get closer to you as long as we're in this world, Lord. And I pray that for everyone today. And just pray you continue to bless this church and the leadership and uh, be with their meeting today, God. I pray everything would just be a uh, point toward Christ through that. And I just pray, Lord, you continue to you celebrate recovery here and the leaders and, and bless and guide them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you once again this morning to join us and stand as we continue worshiping the Lord through music this morning.
It's your bed. 
seated once again. Carla, and I'm a grateful alcoholic and a true believer in God. And uh, for you, so, uh, for those of you who may not remember last year, um, Barb had asked me to get up and announce that I was an alcoholic, and I told her, no way. Well, it's a year later, I'm still an alcoholic, and in September I was able to come up to this podium and pick up my 33-year chip. In the last three years with CR, it's been a lot easier since I've become closer to Jesus. I always considered myself a spiritual person until I actually got to know him and see his work. It's been a much easier road. So we're going to say the serenity prayer. Would you like to join us? And uh, after that, we're going to all come up front and hold hands and sing Sanctuary. That's our closing prayer. So, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. So, I guess since, uh, yeah, if you want to come forward, join hands and join the CR group with one of their traditions that they've implemented here, where they, uh, you know, they, they come together and, and they sing a song, and uh, it's about uh, coming into the Lord's presence, and it's about joining His sanctuary in our sanctuary, which is His sanctuary. So if you wouldn't mind singing with us, looks like we have the lyrics up. If you're in the back, stand, please. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true with 
thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you again Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you one more time with just your voices Lord prepare me And in about five minutes, we will hear the bell ring, and it'll be time for our uh, semi-annual meeting. You are dismissed. Enjoy some fellowship. <laughs>